And when you think about it, that applies to a lot of John's work. It seems to be real, but you know it's fake at the same time. But this painting decisively marks the birth of Wilde's true voice as an artist. It's also noticeable because of what he painted on the reverse, and I just talked a little bit about that. So yeah, we've got Sylvia and, and <coughs> Helen. Yeah, there we go, Sylvia and Helen. And you've kind of got this past, present, and future all compressed together. Now, that's to say, the fact that Wilde painted this on the back of what would have been a major work speaks volumes to the greater value he saw in an American interior. <clears throat> so following Wilde's graduation from college in 1942, the 23-year-old draftee entered the army. And initially, he was assigned to a medical corps in Louisiana, where his duties involved venereal disease inspections and producing propaganda warnings about such afflictions. He was less than enthralled by this. And in 1944, Private Wilde sought a transfer to the Office of Strategic Services, basically a forerunner of the CIA in Washington, D.C., where he hoped his artistic skills might be put to more effective use. And his application was backed by a recommendation that praised his experience, quote, as a camouflage and model maker, noting, and this is the best phrase that I've ever heard, his rather unusual mentality. <laughs> <laughs> and Wilde welcomed the transfer, but it really failed to lessen his hatred of war, of killing, and of the comprehensive loss of liberty that he felt being in the army entailed. So, He's un temperamentally unsuited for army life. Wilde, like his kind of hero, Max Ernst, kept copious notes and sketchbooks in which he alleviated his days for his assignments and frustration at not being able to make art. His work became more satirical. He realized, he said, I realized then that what I had done before was merely highly skilled and facile, and the drawings that he produced during his wartime period would prove a bountiful treasury of ideas for many years to come, even as late as 2004, when he painted myself in 1944, contemplating the following 60 years. And here, Wilde's depicting himself with an expanded head, his left hand is covering his right eye, he oversees a tabletop tableau, featuring what look like multiple self-portraits and one which he appears, appears to be next to a German soldier, basically shooting himself in the head. And Wilde commented about the work, quote, when you reach the age that I have, you don't know how much longer you have left. There are times in which I like to bring everything together as a sort of finale, a summation. And this was done two years before he died. After the war, Wilde returned to the refreshing normalcy of Madison and completed his master's degree in applied art in 1948. And this is actually a copy of his undergraduate transcript. And I, he was a very good student. I mean, uh, the slides aren't great, but there's a lot of A's, there's a lot of B's. However, he did get a C in elementary logic, which I think is great. When you think about the earth paintings, they are not logical. And so the fact that he got a C in elementary logic, I think, is absolutely perfect. Uh, what else did he get? Oh, he dropped the history, technical history of painting. He dropped that. What else did he get a C in? Uh, elementary logic, I uh, got a C in the United States. I assume that's United States history. Animal biology, he got a C in that, too. So there's his undergraduate transcript. And despite numerous offers to teach elsewhere, Walt Wilde chose to stay in the city where he was comfortable, he was welcomed by the proximity of friends and family, and he relished the chance to teach at the school that had given him so much. And teaching also provided him with a steady income beyond what his art might earn. And best of all was the opportunity to teach his true passion, which was drawing. And throughout his long career at Madison, Wilde was a staunch advocate of drawing classes. And he taught the subject at all levels, from freshman to graduate, and he was a dedicated and excellent teacher. 
One student recalled, and this was, I found this in the file, probably from about the 1970s, and this is what the student wrote. He said, it's not that it's a thrill to be taught by one of the real masters, it's that he's always there. Even if the class is at 8.15 in the morning, Wildy's there, always. If you sign up for a Wildy class, you always get Wildy. Which is remarkable, because you think about, and here's a, by the 70s, he's been teaching there for 20 odd years. Most professors, once they get tenure, it's like, well, I'm not teaching those 8.15 in the morning class. I'll do my grad assistant. No, I'll get a teaching assistant. I'm not doing those early morning freshman classes. No, he continued to teach them all the way through. What else? Even so, as much as he loved teaching, he really strove to find a balance between the requirements of the university and his need to make his own art. He had a rule of, ne quote, never appearing here, meaning campus, in the summer. He regularly sought semesters off from teaching as much as one in six, and he, because he had to prepare for the numerous invitational exhibitions, something that he felt made him a better teacher. And again, there were letters, letters, letters in the file of this museum, of this gallery, dear Professor Wilde, we're doing this exhibition, we would love to have two paintings from you, we would love to have three paintings from you. And you know, when you have 200 exhibitions over the course of your career, that means you've got to be in the studio producing work. But with regard to painting, actually I think we've got a couple more examples of his drawing. His, his drawing skill was just absolutely remarkable. But with regard to painting, Wilde commented that it was, quote, intriguing and a wonderful process, but I don't feel passion. Drawing, on the other hand, is so natural, and I get so involved in it that I don't think of it as an effort at all. I look at paintings on a more intellectual level. It's a little like appreciating a novel, where I consciously examine its structure and everything that's gone into its making. But drawing totally absorbs me. It's much more liberated, much less conscious, and much more automatic, end quote. And this attitude is clearly evident at eventide at the Duchess's from 2005. And so this is done the year before he died. And it's a painting that's exhibited, we, when we put it up on the wall at the museum, we put it up right in the middle of the big back wall, and then there was about 22 of the preparatory drawings and sketches <coughs> for this painting surrounding it. So you could really see all the components. So I mean, there was a drawing, I said, I'll show you, I'm doing that, so I'm going to show you. So here's the full painting. Here's the nude standing next to the potato. There's friends. There's Shirley again. So the, this painting, it was just made up of every single element in this painting was prepared not sometimes not just as a painting but as a painting and a drawing before they were all brought together into the final thing so you can really almost look at all these drawings as, as the chapters in the novel and then they bring them all together but it was his passion for drawing particularly in the exquisite but unforgiving medium of silver point that formed the basis of much of Wilde's work he approached drawing from an evolutionary point of view, feeling that every single mark led to another, and then to another, and then you get to the inevitable conclusion of a finished drawing. And even if the initial drawing disappeared under paint, it was this fundamental and necessary structure upon which everything else rested. So it's, yeah, drawing was really like the skeleton. So here's female nude. Just a female nude standing in a black and white square tile floor from 1986. And the square tile floor, this is probably Shirley standing on the floor, and the black the studio floor <coughs> still has the black and white tile. And here are the two of the self-portraits from you know 1993. You know, he's looking back, but he's also looking forward. As I say, self-portraits are very much a common thread through Wilde's career. And again, this harks him back to those early European masters who did the same thing. To quote <coughs> Wilde, my main concern is simply myself. I am the actor on the stage being depicted, which again kind of takes you back to the American interior 
and the almost stage-like composition. He said, most of my painting is scene painting. I paint a proscenium arch and depict activities happening on that stage. And very often, I am one of the actors in whatever event happens to be. To me, there is very little difference between being in the painting and the act of painting. It's the same thing. It's almost impossible for me to separate myself from the things I am doing, and therefore, very often, I include myself. And will these self-portraits, particularly double ones, such as this, and then this is myself twice, aged 80 years, 10 months from 2000, so it's, they're both done at the same time. One is silver point, and the other one is pen and ink. They're kind of savagely introspective and savagely honest, besides being, to all intents and purposes, memento mori. I mean, memento mori basically means, remember, we're all going to die. But they're also commentary on the universality of aging. We're all going to die, we all get older, and it's an inevitable <coughs> conclusion. Moreover, these two works exemplify a fascinating duality in Wilde's art. He produces surreal fantasy scenes set in timeless, otherworldly landscapes while simultaneously marking the passage of real time through his self-portraits. So it's kind of like, again, it's kind of like, I paint these scenes where time seems to have no <coughs> hold or no specific place, and then at the same time, I am very clearly marking time with my self-portraits. <coughs> and indeed, Self-portraits, there are such a feature of Wilde's work, they find echo in his still lives, and both can be regarded as memento mori. Death is the great leveler. We all age, we all eventually die, and Wilde was as well, well aware of this as anyone, and his still lives harken back to European masters, and so here we've got some you know, European master still lives, 1690, Zubaran from 1633, here's Wilde from 1950, and here's Comcots from 1960. Are these your pairs? Pairs. <laughs> and then there's this painting, the, the image, the with old friends in a fright and Da Vinci and landscape from. 2004, and actually, interestingly enough, you can just kind of see it down there, and I'm really sorry about the color, I don't know what it is. There's that little, remember that photograph I showed you of John and Sylvia? Mm -hmm. There it is from 1941 and 2004, you paint Sylvia right in the bottom of the painting. And while Wilde's self-portraits could be scathingly honest to the point of caricature and self-deprecation, portraits of his wife, Shirley, whom he married in 1969, the same year, he was named the Alfred Sessler Professor of Art at UW Madison. And I think that is, what a nice kind of full circle. I mean, here, as I mentioned, you know, when he was in high school, he goes to Sessler's studio. And I'm sure if you'd said to the young John Wilde in the early 1930s, oh, not only are you gonna become an artist, eventually you're gonna become the Alfred Sessler Professor of Art at Madison. I don't know about that, but he did. So it was a really kind of nice, completing the circle from his high school days. His portraits of Shirley are unfailingly warm. Here's another one of his kind of still lives of a dead mouse. And I think this was in his studio too. There's some more <coughs> still lives. But his portraits of Shirley are, there's just something wonderfully warm and kind of affectionate. And I have to say, I think, I, I said this, if there, were ever, if there was one painting gonna go missing out of the show and end up in my house, this would be it. <laughs> it's, just, it's only about this big. It's like this little teeny tiny thing, and it's in a vintage frame that he must have picked up from somewhere, because it's got this green velvet liner. But it's just, here's Shirley, and apparently Leonard was this raccoon who was hanging around the house so much he actually got a name. And so here's Shirley wearing with this, I don't know, it looks like a nettle or something. And here's Leonard and Shirley's wearing the go-go boots. And I, it's just, it, to me, it's got everything about Wilde. It's kind of this bizarre picture. It's, it shows the warmth and affection for Shirley, but it's kind of like this little medieval kind of miniature. And it's only about this big. It's just one of my favorite pieces in the whole show. 
But you know, Shirley was not just his wife of uh, more than 37 years, but she was also his model and his muse and featured in many, many works over the years. But also some were kept, I think, very much as tokens of his affection. And the strength and the duration of their love, as well as Wilde's penchant for combining the personal with the somewhat bizarre, is exemplified in three works. This one from 19. Um, 69, there's the family portraits, there's Shirley sitting in the, you know, with the cat in her lap. Um, and as I say, you know, this was done two years after he married Shirley, and it's, you know, the family portrait. Shirley on a spotted pig, bizarre, but, and then let's see what else have we got. Shirley with banjo, bugs and beans from 1991. And here's John and Shirley on their wedding night. And this is this is interesting. One of the great things about Wilde's work is, you know, sometimes artists, I mean, they want to date the thing, they want to sign the thing, you don't know what the title is. He was always meticulous on the back. Title, date, medium. So it was great from that point of view. But this one is done in 2000. So this is done, you know, 31 years after they got married. And it's kind of got that same kind of wonderful mix of kind of fantasy and bizarreness and real relationships. There's Wilde, he's slender, he's naked. Shirley's face is obscured by her purple hair. Um, I don't know if she ever had purple hair, but she has purple hair in this particular painting. Um, and the narrative is written in the back, and I'll read, this is all written in the back of this particular painting. Our first act was to undress and I put a crimson robe over her shoulders because of the brilliance of her white skin. Then I pointed out to her the importance, magnitude, and utter beauty of her feet. She pointed her left leg and foot out as I talked, and half smiling, listened. Then I gently bound her two feet together, removed her robe, and carried her over to the bed, and later thereon, I placed eight red roses between her toes. So there you go. <laughs> the wedding night. So even in two, even in 2000, 31 years after they get married, he, he paints this particular picture. And this attention to self and personal experience indicates that for Wilde, art was very much a form of psychological self-analysis, a vehicle for the resolution of internal personal issues. Nevertheless, the issues in question are also universal and ubiquitous. Sex, nature, vanity, and the inevitability of death infuse his work. To express them, Wilde often drew inspiration from the land and its animal habitants that surrounded his and Shirley's rural property next to Badfish Creek. And in a letter to his friend and colleague, Gerald Purdy, Wilde wrote, at the moment, I'm gardening, walking in the woods, trying to maintain sanity, and working in my studio from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. on the five days I don't teach. Now, I was talking to a couple of you earlier about Wilde's kind of, you know, solid scheduling. Now, this, there's Bugs, Shirley with Bugs. This I found in his file. So you can see he gets up. At 6.30, he's having breakfast. At 7.30, racing off in the car, scaring the birds to teach. At noon, he has his lunch. Then, back 1.20, he's back teaching again. 4.30, zooming off in the car again. Little cocktail, 7.30, read the paper. I think that's like 10 o'clock. He's uh, fast asleep. And then I think this is at like what 2.30 in the morning, he's wide awake, Shirley's sleeping, he's, he's basically reading because he can't sleep. Yeah, that's at um, 3 o'clock to 3.30 in the morning, he's wide awake. And then this is the other one again. These are just, this is his friend Gerald Purdy who's who sent this to John, and these are his files. So you can kind of see they're actually on just plain stripy paper that you would do. But here, this is on um, Tuesday, so he gets up in the morning, he feeds the dogs and the chickens, works in his studio, takes a nap, works in the studio, four o'clock, chop, 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 work in the garden, and then by eight o'clock, he's fast asleep in front of the TV, here. 
and basically that's going to repeat, repeat, repeat. So clearly he was a man of schedule and routine, so much so that Ger his friend Gerald Purdy actually thought that he could, act he knew it so well that he could actually write it all down. And let's see, yeah, Purdy was uh, a, a student and also a colleague of, um, of John's, but the other thing to remember is, I mean, people really knew uh, John well, but, and we were talking a little bit earlier about how, you know, Will he taught there for 34 years and was colleague and occasional head of department to some of the greatest artists in the state, Warrington Colescott, Dean Meeker, Walter Hamady, Skip Johnson, Santos and Galli, Bill Wiege, Gibson Burr, Ray Gleckler. I mean, these are just huge names in Wisconsin art that we have all been colleagues of John's. And they were all first-class artists, and quite frankly, first-class art artists with first-class egos and personalities. <laughs> and I really think that's why zooming back in the car to the little place by Bad Fish Creek was so important. I mean, dealing with those guys all day and all the students and the bureaucracy of the university, it's like, I gotta get back to Cooksville. Uh, let's see, the Cooksville property was purchased by John and Helen in 1962, and they built not just the house, but basically what amounted to a private arboretum. In 1974, in a faculty information questionnaire, Wilde listed memberships in the Audubon Society, Friends of the Arboretum, the Nature Conservancy, National Wildlife Federation, etc., etc., under his hobbies. And the home consisted of floor to ceiling windows on the west side, which goes out to the porch, which offers wonderful views of the 15 acres of woods, fields, and streams. And as I say, you go past two bedrooms, the end of the hallway, with the plants and artwork. And that was Wilde's studio. And it's a small room, there you go, that's the, that's the studio, with the natural light and in the art, he would sit there, lots of natural light, and this was his haven of peace and inspiration. And it offered comfort and seclusion for him, Shirley, and the dogs away from the hurly-burly of the administrative duties at Madison. Now, and you can just kind of see there, maybe you can't quite see, that there's a shelf just behind John, and that's where all of these little animal skulls and the bodies of the dead mice or birds that he would pick up resided to be worked into various paintings. And he gave them new life in his paintings. Not just life, but what endures also basically beyond death. And with old friends in a frights and Da Vincian landscape, which I showed you earlier, the skulls are in some ways are like metaphors for Wilde's drawings. The fundamental structure that exists between whatever external appearances convey. Now, Wilde's drawings and paintings are complex in both construction and subject matter. As he put it, I like to do what I do with what is called fastidious craftsmanship, but I sometimes like to play tricks with that fastidiousness. I pay attention to the machinations of contemporary art. I like good drawing best of all, and I believe that without it, there is nothing. And as serious as his fastidiousness was, and he often painted with a brush in his right hand and a magnifying glass in the other, Wilde's work is also playful. I like wit and humor, he said, which qualify the human condition. I think my eye is delighted, varyingly, by whatever I see. And this sense of humor could take a slyly mischievous turn. Wilde once drafted a memo in the 1970s, and I assume this was never sent, it was just handwritten, to his colleagues in the art department at Madison, proposing a course called Art and the Vegetable Garden, which he firmly believed he was qualified to teach. Other course suggestions were Art and the Wood-Burning Stove, which he thought Skip Johnson would be um, qualified to teach. Art and Bird Hunting, which Warrington Colescott would teach. And Art and the Bicycle to be taught by Dean Meeker. <laughs> and as fun as these courses sound, the memo was actually a very serious and very sardonic response to the art department sanctioning a course called Art and the Law. Wilde was artistically a strict fundamentalist, and he saw such courses as the beginning of, quote, doing away with the art, teaching of art altogether. 
So this memo was like, oh, I see, I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing it, it was like, oh, so we're now going to teach art in a lot. Well, I'll teach the art of vegetable gardening, Skip Johnson will teach the art of the wood burning stove, and then he comes up with some others, and he basically says, and if these classes are successful, we won't have to teach art at all, will we? So it's all very funny, it's all very playful, but the message is, is we should be sticking to the basics. And herein lies the wonderful paradox that was John Weldy. For all his resolute determination to defend, promote, and teach perhaps the most basic and traditional element of art, drawing, his work often contains nudity, sex, violence, and strays into territory that some people might find uncomfortable. There's an undeniable whiff of kinkiness in some of his work. The homage to tomorrow from 1987. And many of his works seem at odds with the conservatively dressed college professor. Collar, tie, jacket. Wilde was well aware of the dichotomy, I think, between public and private behaviors and mankind's tendency towards self-gratification by whatever means available. In 1999, he rather pessimistically told Milwaukee Journal Sentinelist James Auer, mankind is creating real problems for itself through the devouring of the environment and the population explosion. I take a kind of sad view of human avarice and of the media, especially now that its power has been multiplied by the internet. That's pretty prescient. I mean, 1999, the internet certainly wasn't what it is today. And I think it's this sensitivity to the outside world and the exasperation that it reflects arguably explains Wilde's retreat into his own head, his imagination, and his piece of property outside Cooksville. I mean, after all, if the real, if the real world isn't exactly what you want, why not create your own? And well, John Wilde's career ultimately <coughs> eclipsed those of his mentors, Clemens, Singale, Sessler, and Watrous. And amongst his Wisconsin peers, he's perhaps unequaled in the number of exhibitions and collections that have featured his work. But most important of all, John Wilde himself is a testament to the fact that one can choose to live and work locally, yet achieve lasting national recognition and stature. Everything he needed was in two places, all around him in the fertile Wisconsin landscape and in his equally fecund imagination, which knew no boundaries. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.